Hello boys and girls. Today we are going to start reading a book called Street Child which is authored by Burley Duarte. This book is a fiction chapter book based on historical facts inspired by the Victorian London era. Times were tough and challenging and this book, this book revolves around the themes of poverty, kindness, judging others and compassion. The book opens in the slums of London around mid-1800s where Jim's family has been forced to live owing to the circumstances they are in. Victorian London was a dangerous place for the poor and the homeless where every day was a battle for survival. Boys and girls, do keep a notebook next to you. As we read along, underline or jot down interesting words and phrases. You could also highlight words that you'd like to check the meanings of later. You decree that strengthening our spellings and enhancing our vocabulary are great takeaways of reading. I also want you to keep in mind the writing style that the author has used. Burley Dorothy was a teacher herself and has used meaty, juicy words, interesting sentence openers, a variety of fronted adverbials and imagery to make her writing impressionable. Once we're done with the reading, I'd really like you to summarize the chapter in your words. Remember the strategies that we talk about in class, the strategies of rereading. Feel free to reread the chapter once done so that you really have a good command of what you've read. Taking a pinch of what you read and annotating the figurative language that you come across. Believe me, there'll be lots of it. When you're summarizing, also remember to take the most important details while you could do away with a few things which are not really required. Summarizing something is like sharing the crux of something, just highlighting on the main point of the text. Keep in mind the setting of the plot and the characters introduced and involved as the story progresses. As I always say, do make a draft of your summary first, then self-edit it. You know that proofreading is a great strategy, isn't it? Add in the double adjectives that you're so good at. Add in the expanded noun phrases, a few figurative techniques such as a simile, metaphor, personification, oxymoron, onomatopoeia, hyperbole. Etc. Once you've written your summary, feel free to share your summary with a family member or a friend. You can also get back to me. Also share what impact the chapter has made on you. Did it get you thinking? Did the story transport you to the timeline of the story? Could you feel for the characters? Do you have any connections? Well, without further ado, let's get going. Here we go. Happy reading, boys and girls. Tell me your story, Jim. Jim Jarvis. Want to know who that is? It's me. That's my name. Only thing I've got is my name. And I'd give it away to this man, Barney. His name is, or something like that. He told me once, only I forget it, see, and I don't like to ask him again. Mister, I call him to his face, that is. But there's a little space in my head where his name is Barney. He keeps asking me things. He wants to know my story. That's what he tells me. My story, mister? What do you want to know that for? Ain't much of a story, mine ain't. And he looks at me all quiet. It is, Jim, he says. It's a very special story. It changed my life, child, meeting you. Funny that, ain't it? Because he changed my life. Barney did. I can't believe my luck, and that's a fact. Here I am with food in my belly, and good hot food at that, and plenty more where that came from, he says. I'm wearing clothes that smell nice, and that don't have no holes in neither. And I'm in this room where there's a great big fire burning and plenty more logs to put on it so that it won't just die off. There's just me and him. The, the other boys are upstairs in their hammock, all cozy in the big room we sleep in. And downstairs, there's just me and him, special. I want to laugh. I'm so full of something that I want to laugh out loud. And I stuff my fist in my mouth to stop myself. Barney gives me that look, all quiet. 
Just tell me your story. My story? Well, I creep back to the fire for this. I hug my knees. I close my eyes to shut out the way the flames dance about and the way his shadow and mine climb up and down the walls. I shut out the sound of the fire sniffing like a dog at a rat hole. And I think I can hear someone talking very softly. It's a woman's voice talking to a child. I think she's talking to me. Mister, I says, just whispering so I don't chase the voice away. Can I tell you about my mom? Chapter 1. The Shilling Pie Jim Jarvis hopped about on the edge of the road, his feet blue with cold. Passing carriages flung muddy snow up into his face and his eyes, and the swaying horses slithered and skidded as they whipped on by their drivers. At last, Jim saw his chance and made a dash for it through the traffic. The little shops in the dark street all glowed yellow with their hanging lamps, and Jim dodged from one light to the next until he came to the shop he was looking for. It was the meat pudding shop. Hungry boys and skinny dogs hovered around the doorway, watching for scraps. Jim pushed past them, his coin as hot as a piece of coal in his fist. He could hear his stomach gurgling as a rich smell of hot gravy met him. Mrs. Hodder was trying to sweep the soggy floor and sprinkle new straw down when Jim ran in. You can run right out again, she shouted to him, if I'm not sick of little boys today. But I've come to buy a pudding, Jim told her. He danced up and down, opening and closing his fist so his coin winked at her like an eye. She pressed it out of his hand and bit it. Where did you find this, little shrimp, she asked him. And stop your dancing. You're making me rock like a ship at sea. Jim hopped onto a dry patch of straw, mass purse, and she said there won't be no more because that's the last shilling we got, and I know that's true because I emptied it for her. So make it a good one, Mrs. Hutter. Make it big and lots of gravy. He ran home with the pie clutched to his chest, warming him through his cloth wrapping. Some of the boys outside the shop tried to chase him, but he soon lost them in the dark alleys, his heart thudding in case they caught him and stole the pie. At last he came to his home, in a house so full of families that he sometimes wondered how the floors and the walls didn't come tumbling down with the weight and the noise of them all. He, he ran upstairs and burst into the room his own family lived in. He was panting with triumph and excitement. I've got the pie! I've got the pie! He sang out. Lee jumped up and ran to him, pulling him over towards a fire so they could spread out the pudding cloth on the hearth. They broke off chunks of pastry and dipped them into the brimming gravy. What about Ma? asked Lizzie. She won't want it, Emily said. She never eats. Lizzie pulled Jim's hand back as he was reaching out for another chunk. But the gravy might do her good, she suggested. Just a little taste. Stop shoveling it down so fast, Jim. Let Ma have a bite. She turned round to her mother's pile of bedding and pulled back the ragged cover. Ma, she whispered, try a bit. It's lovely. She held a piece of gravy-soaked pie crust to her lips, but her mother shook her head and turned over, huddling her rug around her. I, I have it, said Jim. But Lizzie put it on the corner of her mouth's bed rags. She might feel like it later, she said. The smell might tempt her. I told you, said Emily, she don't want food no more. That's what she said. Jim paused for a moment in his eating, his hand resting over his portion of pie in case his sister snatched it away from him. What's the matter with Ma? he asked. Nothing's the matter, said Emily. She chucked a log on the fire, watching how the flames curled themselves around it. She's tired, is all, Lizzie prompted. She just wants to sleep, don't she? She's been asleep all day, Jim said, and yesterday, and the day before. Just eat your pie, said Emily. You heard what she said. There's no more shillings in that purse, so don't expect no more pies after this one. She'll get better soon, Lizzie said, and then she'll be able to go back to work. There are lots of jobs for cooks. We'll soon be out of this place. That's what she told me, Jim. Will we go back to her cottage? Jim asked. 
Lizzie shook her head. You know we can't go there, Jim. We had to move out when father died. Eat your pie, said Emily. She wants us to enjoy it. But the pie had grown cold before the children finished it. They pulled the rag pile close to the hearth and curled up together. Jim between Emily and Lizzie. In all the rooms of the house, they could hear people muttering and yawning and snatching. Outside in the street, dogs were howling and carriage wheels trundled on the slushy roads. Jim lay awake. He could hear how his mother's breath rattled in her throat, and he knew by the way she tossed and turned that she wasn't asleep. He could tell by the way his sisters lay and still eat sight of him that they were awake too listening through the night to its noise longing for day to come.